Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Shackman. We've talked to you before about those frightening four words heard all too often from Wall Street. This time, it's different. Perhaps besides Wall Street, nowhere else is that said as much as in Silicon Valley and among the purveyors of every aspect of today's technological and digital revolution. And today is different, but it also fits into a pattern of human invention that has been part of our evolutionary biology and neurology, built around our curiosity, the desire to learn, and the need to connect and share stories and information. In this quest, there have been several inflection points along the way. My guest, former FCC Commissioner Tom Wheeler, argues in his new book that they are Gutenberg and the invention of movable type and the telegraph, both of which were every bit as profound as today's insanely great products. To take us both back and forward in that journey, I am joined by Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler is a visiting fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. He was chairman of the Federal Communications Commission from 2013 to 2017, and his newest book is From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future. Tom Wheeler, thanks so much for joining us. Jeff, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Great to have you here. Why did you select ultimately these two? Certainly there have been many profound inventions along the way, particularly even related to information and communication. How did you zero in on these two? Well, actually, there, there are three in two eras. There was the first, there was the original information revolution, which was Gutenberg, which, who, who uh, freed uh, knowledge and information from uh, the priestly and the powerful and allowed it to disseminate to the world, uh, setting up today. And then there was about 400 years later, the combination of the telegraph, the first uh, electronic network, and the steam railroad, uh, the first high-speed network. And together, um, they created the Industrial um, Revolution that uh, has shaped us for the last 150 years and set us on a path where there were two parallel technological developments. One was the ubiquity of connectivity, where we went from, from telegraph to telephone to mobile to everything being connected. The other was the, the uh, computing power, um, which, uh, which actually started back with the, uh, the steam engine um, and moved through the, you know, the big frame, the, the big mainframes uh, up to uh, microchips today. And for the last Oh, several decades. These two have been looking at each other across a chasm, and then all of a sudden they jumped the chasm and had sex. <laughs> and we now have a reality where everything computes and everything communicates, and that sets us up for the next transformational revolution. If we look back historically at these three things that you just delineated, were there clues at the time? Were there things that stand out in retrospect that told us that these were things that would be lasting, that these were things that would be profound? What a great question, Jeff. Um, yes, um, because each of them um, was a transformational technology and the result of that transformation was to change uh, economic behavior, to change social uh, behavior. We can see both of those reiterate themselves today. For instance, um, if you take and you peel back the onion of digital code, you eventually get to Gutenberg's breakthrough idea. Now, it was not that you can press letters down um, on, uh, on, on paper, it was that you would take the information and break it into its smallest parts so that it could be disaggregated and re-aggregated time and time again. And that's what we do with digital information. That then links to, um, to Morris's telegraph and the dots and dashes and in fact, Morris code was uh, developed when Morris's assistant went to a print shop and started counting the number of pieces of type 
in each type box and gave the letter that was used the most the simplest code and then went from there. And so the letter E is a single dot and it gets more complex as you go from there. So there is a, there is a pattern where uh, it's Darwinian almost, where there is evolution as one technology leads to another. The same story happened um, over on the computing side, where, where literally um, at the time when the steam locomotive, the steam, the, the steam engine was revolutionizing um, uh, industrial production in particular, um, a man by the name of Charles Babbage says, well, why can't I harness this to do computations? And he developed all the key ideas that today we call a computer. And you can watch from steam the evolution of computing on to microchips today. One of the things that it does seem different today, and you talk about this and from Gutenberg to Google, is that when we access information today, when we use information today, it is at the same time creating more information or more assets, as you talk about. How is that profoundly different, or is it? Well, Jeff, I, I make the point in the book that the, the digital, the, the, the asset of the 21st century is digital information. It used to be that assets were hard things. It was, you know, coal or oil or automobiles or whatever. And today, um, uh, the, the asset of the 21st century is the information that is used to create new assets. So um, every time I do something digitally, I am creating uh, information that can be uh, put into an algorithm to create new information. And, and one of the points that I make in From Gutenberg to Google is that we have not yet crossed over to a period as transformational as the, uh, as the middle of the 15th century and Gutenberg in the middle of the 19th century and the railroad and telegraph. But we're on the cusp of it, and we are on the cusp of it because of how we use that information and how the networks that connect us are set to change again. You know, a network has always been something that hold an asset from point A to point B. Your, your wireless phone does that today. It, it delivers uh, Google Maps uh, information to you. The next generation of networks will be themselves computers talking to each other so that the role of the network becomes not transportation, but orchestration of data. That's what an autonomous car is all about. How do you orchestrate all this flood of data so the cars don't hit each other? And when we move from digital transportation to digital orchestration, everything we do then produces a new product with its own value. Is there a danger in this, given the speed at which we're moving, that basically we jump the shark, that in, in terms of these other historical examples, each had an opportunity to evolve kind of organically. Here there's always the danger that we move on to something new before we've absorbed the current means of communication and information. And what's the price that we pay for that? Jeff, you are so right. And the challenge that I had as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission was how do we keep pace with the changes in network uh, technology? And what those changes, as you indicate, a component of those changes is the velocity at which they are hitting us. And we have lost the buffer of time. It, it used to be that there would be a new change and then there would be years, if not decades, that we could assimilate its effect. Now it's on us instantaneously. It has an instantaneous effect on our economic activity, on our social lives. And, and we lose that buffer of time 
to deal with it. And that then ends up having an impact on the way we think about things. You know, you know, democracy was designed to be slow so that everybody could have their input. But change is coming so fast that it makes autocracies with their, hey, I've got an answer. We don't have to go through this process. Or concepts like Brexit uh, or even Donald Trump seem to be um, an obvious answer that people go to rather than the struggle of having to work your way through what that effect is. And so I think we're going to have to change the way in which we approach change, both as individuals and as the individuals are representatives in government. Part of it is, and this gets back to what I was asking you early on in terms of what the signals were with respect to those earlier inventions, to understand why they were important. Because part of the problem with speed today seems to be that we don't know what's important and that we're constantly chasing the new shiny object and not really looking at the big picture. Well, I think you're absolutely right that one of and it's a and it's a challenge that is that is that faced um, not only throughout the economy but especially in Silicon Valley where where the attitude is um, wow look what we've done right. rather than what are the consequences and how do we mitigate against adverse consequences. And so what we as individuals and what those of us who are involved in the technology business need to be thinking is not just, gee, I can build it and then stop there. But if I build it, what are the consequences and how do I think about my obligations in that regard? You know, there has tell you a quick story. In the middle of the 19th century, when the railroad was taking off, it was going across uh, fields and throwing off hot cinders out of the smokestack. And those cinders would set houses and barns and hayricks afire. And there became the concept of negligence, legal concept of negligence, that was applied to the railroads that got them to say, well, wait a minute, what are we doing to mitigate this impact? And so they put screens on the top of the smokestacks to catch the hot cinders. What are we doing in our new technologies to think about what are the effects and how do we mitigate the adverse effects? When we look at those technologies today, and, and maybe this was a reality in, in, in past leaps as well, but it doesn't seem like it was to the same extent at least, that there's both the implication of the technology and what it does for us, but there's also the economic impact of it, and that's so much more profound today and so much more part of the equation. Uh, absolutely, and, and technology has always had a big economic uh, uh, impact, and there's always been pushback. I mean, we only have to go back to, uh, to you know, uh, how uh, the looms, uh, the beginning Industrial Revolution in, uh, in England, um, and Ned Ludd and the Luddites who tried to, uh, who thought they were going to destroy them, uh, destroy uh, economic activity. Uh, the key here is that we cannot flee this change. We have to confront it this change that that it's not just enough to say oh wow if only we could live in the good old days well if you, the, the the essence of from gutenberg to google is to talk about what those good old days were like and they were tough you know think about think about for instance how the railroad and the telegraph drove the industrial revolution which created the map of urban America. Never before had people been congregated in such numbers in one place. And what happened? Well, you had cholera outbreaks because of the fact that, um, that you had bad water and, and sanitation. And so the people together had to figure out how to deal 
with with that. You had public safety threats where all of a sudden you had masses of people and, and you had you needed a police force, you needed a fire force, and the people had to work together on that. You had to do something um, about uh, uh, about health care and how do you move from the uh, the uh, the country dock that you left behind to a system that can provide for mass uh, illness and the same concept with how do you deal with education? You've moved from the one room school marm schoolhouse to um, to the need to have a mass of educated people who can work in the factories. And and so the point I make is that those are horrific challenges. Those were things that had never been confronted before. People didn't run away from them. They stepped up and they said, we need to work together. And it wasn't always smooth and it wasn't always pretty, but they came up with solutions. And that's the same kind of thing that we have to be doing now. One of the things that seems to have happened, and I'm not sure there's a precise point we can identify when this happened, is this belief that whatever the problem that technology creates for us, that somehow there's another technological solution that will come along to solve it. And to the extent that we believe that, or that a lot of people believe that, it makes thinking about these things and worrying about these things less important in some ways to people. People are the only solution to the challenges. Let's talk about AI, for instance, everybody's running around with their hair on fire about how, oh my goodness, here's the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have. Um, And yes, it's going to have a huge impact, but somehow we are forgetting the fact that we are still in control. And how are we going to make decisions that affect the development of artificial intelligence. And um, uh, they, it is, you know, like I said, we're still, we're still the ones in control, and, um, and we need to be pulling ourselves together and saying, what are we going to do to deal with these challenges, just like earlier generations dealt with cholera and education and everything else? What about this belief, though, and and maybe it comes from too much science fiction that that a generation has grown up on, that technology will always win out, that technology will find a way, that that it is moving faster and more powerful than people and their ability to handle it? So maybe it is a science fiction issue, as you suggest, Mm -hmm. Jeff, but I actually think that it is a lack of appreciation for historical perspective. Mm -hmm. If there is a story, if there is a message that comes out of from Gutenberg to Google, it is that we have been here before. Mankind has seen technological changes reshape individuals and institutions and has dealt with it. And we can too. And and the, the, the worry about today is that rather than coming together, to deal with it collectively, we break into tribes. And, um, and in fact, the technology enables or assists that breaking into tribes. We need to come together to identify what are collective solutions so that we're setting the terms under which technology will behave. Let me just take one more step on that. When, when the Industrial Revolution came along in the mid-19th century, Everybody looked around and said, oh, my goodness, you know, the the rules that governed um, agrarian mercantilism don't work in this industrial era anymore. And so we we developed over a period of years a set of rules, whether it be antitrust laws or consumer protection laws or worker protection laws or whatever the case may be. And those protections established guardrails for the behavior of the application of the technology. We are now at a point where we're looking and saying, oh my goodness, we're in the internet age. And the rules that were adequate for the industrial age 
are no longer adequate for the challenge we face. And so our challenge is the establishment of new rules, new guardrails that protect a competitive market, that protect consumers, and protect capitalism in the process. And and in the context of what we've been talking about, though, it seems that one of the greatest obstacles is the speed that creates fear and the fear that creates tribalism that, that really creates the impediments to doing what you're saying. Absolutely. But I mean, again, we've been here before. Let's, let's go way back. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's go back 500 years to the Renaissance. You know, and we think today that the Renaissance, wow, what a magical era! All these great things happened that shaped the rest of history. It must have been hell to live through, because the basic underpinnings that had ruled mankind for millennia suddenly all came apart. Beliefs fell apart. Economies fall, fell apart. Personal behavior and ideas fell apart. The name of the game became, instead of being told what to believe, suddenly the scientific method was nothing but arguing about what you believe. It must have been hellish. And yet we look back on it and we say, my goodness, look what came out of that. And so... so we are naive if we think that absent our active involvement, that things are going to solve themselves or that technology is going to solve the issue. How do we make people in the world of technology understand exactly what you're saying, understand that we've been here before, that there is this history, that that history is, is, is a valuable resource in understanding where we are today, and that contrary to, to that, those four words, this time it's different, that in fact it's not different. Well, Jeff, that's why I wrote from Gutenberg to Google. I mean, I'm a guy who has run technology companies, um, who, has, um, who has been a venture capitalist that invested in new technology companies and who was the regulator for one-sixth of the economy that was the new technology networks that the other five-sixths of the economy relied on. And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, what's the foundation that we can all turn to? And I found that foundation in history, that the technology is evolutionary and the experience caused by the new technologies along the way is the same kind of situation we're facing now. And what then becomes, and, and this really goes to the heart of what, what you lived with for all those years, what is the role of government in shaping this? Um, the role of government is, is, is not to flee. Um, and my worry, what we're seeing right now in the current administration is that everybody hearkens back to, oh, let's think about what the good old days were like rather than stepping up and facing the new challenges. We are going to have to say the world has changed. Industrial solutions are no longer the solution. We need to have new approaches to new challenges, including the way government works. So let me give you a quick example. You know, I ran a government bureaucracy, the Federal Communications Commission. How did that bureaucracy come to be? How did that structure of bureaucracy come to be? It First of all, it was created to offset the power of industrial bureaucracies. What is, uh, how were industries managed? Well, you had guys on the floor of the factory who had to follow rules, who were watched over by supervisors to make sure they were following the rules, who were watched over by managers to make sure that all the rules were going through. And you have this bureaucracy that was created. And when you created the countervailing force, why should we be surprised that we have a rules-based bureaucracy that is in our government. Now, as you and your listeners know, today we have moved into a world that requires agility. I can remember when I was running a software company in the 80s, 
the software production was a linear activity. You did A, you did B, you did C, and it was done, and it fell off the edge. We call it the waterfall approach. It kind of fell off the edge and was done. Today, software is never done because the world is constantly changing, and that's called agile software development. And what we need is agile government oversight, where the, where the job of government becomes not these kind of strict mother may I, this is what you must do, but a structure that says, hey, wait a minute, is this in the common good? And who's the referee on the field to throw the flag when it isn't? Tom Wheeler, his book is From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future. Tom, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Jeff, thank you. Thank you.